write down this estimate with these several components and then have these multiplicative the factors that scale up for the capacity units that scale up for the effect of inflation and for the changes in operating conditions. So in today's class, we're going to work through three examples to illustrate this principle. And one of them is going to be pretty involved. So uh, we need to have a systematic way to, to follow these problems. The systematic approach I will show you is something that you readily ended up in an Excel spreadsheet or MATLAB or some coding language that you want. And it's relatively straightforward, but the key is to follow it in the same, in the same way every time. So the first is to start the base class that you put on the database. You should go ahead and multiply that to adjust the fact that the database will not match the capacity we're looking for. We'll inflate the price for the fact that the database will also be at some historical point in time, usually 1970. And then we'll adjust for inflation, uh, sorry, installation, and the fact that the conditions in the database don't match the conditions that we're getting. So the procedure that we followed in the class uh, previously on Thursday was the following. I hope those of you over there on the side of the class can see this, so um, I'll read it out to you in just a single word. The first step is to pick the correlation that we're looking for. So we were going to use the one word as a text box and post it as a PDF to the course website. We can look up the correlation uh, through the table of contents in chapter 1, and then cross-reference the appropriate chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, up to chapter, up to chapter 9, I think, uh, to find the particular unit that we're looking for. So what we put is divided up into exchanges, reactors, and separation equipment, utilities, and in today's class, we're going to look at one of the those types. Once you identify the correct correlation that matches the unit that you're looking at, estimating, you check very the very next thing you do is check that the range of the correlation beats the range that you're looking at. So you show an estimating amount of the estimation, you check the ratio, and make sure that the bounds of the ratio are valid for our situation. You'll see that in the example on the page. You read off the base cost, that's step number three. The fourth step is that we will then adjust the capacity. We use that the rule then that we can simply ratio the capacity raised to the appropriate So the capacity adjustment then step four here requires that we read off that correct exponent. Next, we will adjust for the fact that the material of construction the pressure that the unit operates at and the temperature that the unit operates at doesn't match the, uh, the, the base case material pressure and temperature doesn't match our requirements. So we will adjust for that. This is the new component in today's class. And there's a bit of a complication in the step that we need to pay attention to. That will give us, we'll add out these, these factors over here from the previous step. So we'll get that, um, add those up in the future, and just multiply it and get a bare module factor in 1970. Then we will adjust for inflation through a simple ratio of um, either the Marsh and Swift index or the chemical engineering index to get those values in the current year that we're looking at, 2011. Uh, the examples here in the slide all call for 2000. But you would, in your uh, first project, be looking at adjusting those for 2011, for 2012. We only have the index available for 2011, so uh, you would just use the most recent one available. And then finally, you report the range. Uh, that range you get from the error estimates back up here when you looked up the correlation, it reports the percentage error. So we would then take this bare module factor and simply multiply it to the error range and report the lower and upper bound rather than the single value itself. Okay, so that's the, that's the flow, flow that we're going to follow. And uh, we, just to recap that then, we both have this example for, for this heat exchanger over here, it's the Shell and heat exchanger, uh, some, some photos of the of one. And we resized, uh, sorry, we calculated the cost for this heat exchange yesterday, we did that approach. So step one was we looked up the correlation. So we will, um, when we reported these, you would like the correlation, just reference to page number and your source of information. 
Step two is the range of K. We verified that 70 divided by 100 was within the range uh, that took us for a for. The base cost, looking up from the table, was $8,000. There was no need for a capacity, uh, sorry, capacity adjustment. Yes, we needed to do that. That's the 70 divided by 100, raised to the exponent 0.71. So that, that exponent was looked up on the correlation as well. There was no need to adjust the material pressure and temperature in this particular case because we were looking at a carbon steel heat exchanger which matched with the base case and we were looking at a pressure that was uh, close to the base case pressure as well. Then that gets us the Venn module factor in 1970 which we then escalate up to 2000 using the ratio of 1089 divided by 300 and then reported a range. So Don Woods uh, emphasizes in that book, if you read his PDF there, um, he gives a personal anecdote where he once reported the cost estimate for a project he was working on for a company and he just gave him the dollar figure of it, about, I forget his number, but I it was $2 million. Unfortunately, he didn't report the error range and so when the project continued on a few months later, um, the actual cost came closer to something like $3 million. The problem is that once you mention it all figure to, to management and especially people who control budgets, that's the number that sticks in their head. And it's very hard to persuade them otherwise afterwards. So if you're inclined when you're reporting this, rather report the upper bound than the lower bound. Okay? So the thing is just for budgeting purposes, you'll see this when you work in companies, they don't mind spending money, but the problem is going to ask for more money. So if you give them an upper bound estimate, that's generally going to be safer bet and rather come in under budget and do it a little bit better as well. So, so the range is, is very important to report. Or we'll to be aware of this. Okay, so now <coughs> we're going to get to some of those complicating factors of looking at adjusting for uh, different pressures, different um, different materials and construction. And what we do is we look up in the tables here, for example, if we had a heat exchanger where the pressure was 3 MPa, and we needed shelf and tubes of stainless steel, um, and have a copy of that correlation here. Uh, we were looking at a heat exchanger of, uh, I say, 3 MPa. So here we would take the one to pretty close to 2.9 MPa. There's a multiple factor there of 1.25 that we would, we would multiply our cost by. So we estimate our base cost, multiply it for capacity, then we multiply it by an additional 1.25, taking into account that we're operating at a higher pressure. That, that product of those we then multiply again by a factor of 3 to account for the sheet factor that's the stainless steel 316 for the shell and shoot. So these are multiple of the fact uh, that we, we add. We don't say, we don't add up um, the 1.25 plus 3 and then use the sum of those to multiply the base cost by. We say the base cost times the capacity inflation raised to that exponent, times the pressure adjustment factor, times the stainless steel adjustment factor. Okay, so these, these, are, these are multiplicative costs, very, very important. Uh, there's some other multiplicative costs listed here in the comments. If you were looking at um, YouTubes or, or you had a kettle reboiler included, or you were looking at the cost of the tubes only, um, there was the, the those factors given over there. So what I'd uh, like to do is I'd like you to take a, a minute here. Uh, we're going to look at a reflux drum here from the distillation column. So this is at the top of the distillation column. You know, uh, sorry, the bottom of the distillation column. You sorry, the top of the distillation column. You normally see the reflux drum, um, and we're going to estimate the cost of this unit over here. So it's a horizontal unit, cylindrical with disc tanks, operating at a normal pressure of 0.3 MPa, 290 Kelvin made from carbon steel, and our design has that size at 57 meters cube. So I'd like you to take, a, uh, take that information down, if you don't have it already in front of you. So we're going to change the slide, because I suppose you don't have the appropriate uh, page from Don Woods' book here. We're going to put that up on the board here in a minute. Uh, so we'll just take this information down. And then come up with a cost estimate for this new drum. 
but we were requiring a hardly steel flux drum, horizontal cylindrical with this dense, uh, that matches the base case. So we don't need to adjust for materials, we don't need to adjust for pressure, we don't need to adjust for temperature. So step five here in this case is not good. then would be 10,200 and the bare module factor of that table was 3 and 0. So the bare module factor over here was 3. This is cost installed, painted, um, uncrated, inspected, all those things that go into the bare module that we discussed in the previous class. And then the final step is on to adjust this for inflation. We'll use the Marshall and Swift for 2000, then that's 30,600 times 1089 divided 301 the ratio of the 2000 to 1970 index values, which gets you a cost of 1,000, I'm sorry, 110,700. So, quite a bit of money just for the little reflux drum of the size of the distillation column. If we report those ranges then, that would be anywhere, depending on the supplier we choose and our relationship with the supplier, somewhere between 66,000 to 155,000. Installed. So delivered, installed, piping, up to the rest of the distillation column. So control systems and instrumentation around that all, all added into that cost. How do you account for like technology change over the last 30 years? Right, uh, so that is one limitation of these indexes and this, this whole approach is that it is, there's clearly uh, been some major technology increments over the time, but uh, that's, so that's not taken into account. But you could argue for these sorts of vessels, um, the technology cost would be only on the instrumentation side, which would be a small fraction of that. It's a small component in the bare module factor. So that bare module factor, that multiply, multiplier of three, gets made up of sub-entries. Sub um, the major components there are labor, materials, piping. But there is a, there's a small component for instrumentation. We'll actually look at that in a, in a bit. Um, so that's the part that's likely to have changed. The technology to fabricate these units is not, not very different to what it was back uh, 40 years ago. Okay, so this is something that you should be able to do fairly quickly in um, the midterm or uh, even in the spreadsheets. Because there's very little uh, to this case when we're, uh, we're going to have to adjust for pressure and temperature and materials. But the next case we're going to look at, we do require some of that adjustment. Okay, so what I'd like you to work on then is uh, this case for a heat exchanger. So again, uh, same approach. Uh, estimate the bare module cost in 2000 for a shell and shoot heat exchanger. You should have the slide for that. Um, but I, I will uh, write this up for you again. So shell and shoot heat exchanger operating this time, it's at a higher pressure, 5.6 MPa. Surface area of the tube is 70 meters squared, but it's made from 316 stainless steel, the shell and the tubes.
Six would be to say, well, that's my uh, my cost over there, but what's my FOB installed cost? Just to take this heat exchanger now, I've adjusted it for higher temperature, higher pressure. Uh, you may not want to write this down actually because this is incorrect. But <laughs> the temptation is to do this. Um, so to say, well, this is my price that the vendor is going to charge me just to say, take the base case exchanger and modify it for higher pressure operation made from different materials. <coughs> But that's not installed, inspected, painted, insulated, etc. All those things that go into the FOB price. So then you might want to say FOB 1970 is then to take this 28,300 and multiply it by that bare module factor up on this on the table, which is 3.14. And then you may say FOB in 2000 is to take FOB in 1970 and ratio it by the inflation rates and then report a final cost of 321,700 plus 40%. So let's just take a note of this number, 321,000. What's wrong, what might be wrong, and what do you think? Why am I saying that this is not the approach to follow? It seems reasonable it's to inflate for the materials, to inflate for the pressure, and then just follow the rest of the process for inflating for time. Material construction has been affected a laser and the packing module on this bare module comes with the bare module factor will be. Okay, yeah, so it, you're on the right track though, it's not, but piping is not one of the factors. No, so it's not piping. Uh, yeah, yeah, the other one. Right. So the key issue is here, the bare module factor of 3.14 that you've been multiplying this cost by, this cost has been inflated already for materials and, carb, uh, and for pressure. But really, installing a unit, whether it's made from carbon steel or made from 316, inspecting it, painting it, insulating it, um, preparing the foundations, really is not the factor of the material of construction. So it's, it's an artificial or premature to inflate um, this, this value by 3.14. Okay? It would be, you're overestimating the cost of the, of the vessel, of the, of the full installation price. Um, fairly substantially, because you're, you're first escalating for materials and pressure, and then you're adding the bare module factor onto that. You're going to get a tremendous overestimate. This bare module factor 3.14 is more appropriate to multiply by a lower number because the installation of that unit is going to be the same no matter what the materials and, and pressure rates are. So the way to, to follow it, the thinking, is correct up to this point over here. So let's take it from step four, where we've estimated the capacity adjustment, and let's let's proceed from that step five onwards in, in, a, in a slightly more appropriate manner. So a more suitable approach is to say, back in 1970, what would be the price of um, the unit, step five, let's say what is the price in $1970 of the unit 
and everything is told. What I'm going to just do for convenience is I'm going to call this dollar figure that we landed up here C subscript zero. So this is our base cost, C zero. And it's in nineteen seventy dollars. Uh, no, yeah, notice I will always I will always leave leave the inflation for the very last step. Uh, that's my preference. In some of the slides, uh, Dr. Mullen tends to inflate up over here and then work in, in two thousand dollars all the way onwards. It's, it's immaterial. I prefer just to with, to all the inflation complexity at the end. So for now, we're working in nineteen seventy dollars. For that heat exchanger, six thousand two hundred and ten dollars from carbon steel. If we had to pay for it installed as is, we would then simply say it's the base cost times the bare module factor, which is 6210 times 314, which gets you a cost of 19,500. So this is to install a carbon steel um, basic heat exchanger. So from that we can then calculate, well, what is the cost of installation only? Well, that's simply the, the 19500 that we've had to pay for the unit and installation, but subtract out the unit cost of 6210 gets you 13290 so if I had to do this in notation, um, symbolically, I'd say C0 times the bare module factor minus the cost of the unit, or we can simply write C0 is the bare module factor minus 1. If we're looking at it algebraically. This is the price, the incremental cost that you're paying only for installation. So that's a key number we have to bear in mind. Now let's 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 take a look at what happens to the, the pressure and the material of the obstruction. We can say do a similar a similar analysis. So this would be the first part over here. We're looking at just the isolating the installation cost. Let's try to isolate the cost, the incremental cost due to the pressure and due to the um, materials of construction requirement. So there we can say the unit price. So the, the unit correcting for materials and pressure would be equal to the $6,210 that we paid multiplied by the material factor multiplied by the pressure factor which is 6 to 10 times the material factor of 3 times the pressure factor of 1.52 gets you 28,300. <coughs> so that heat exchanger, uninstalled, just the unit itself, the price you would have to pay to the vendor, for the vendor to make your heat exchanger from carbon steel, uh, from 316, and to make it would stand higher pressure rating would be 28,000 rather than the 6,200. So by that, by a similar construction, we can then find out the incremental cost due to this material and pressure requirement would be simply to take the bare module cost that we've been multiplied by the material factor and multiplied by the pressure factor, subtract out the base cost of the, of the unit, <coughs> that gets me my incremental cost, or simply the base cost times Fp times Fn minus 1, if I wanted to write it symbolic. And in dollar figures that comes out to I substituted in the 22,090. So I'm paying $22,000 in addition to the $6,000 uh, to accommodate these higher materials and 
special requirements. So let me just put in orange here that the cost I'm going to pay the vendor of this unit. I'm going to pay the vendor 6,200 to fabricate a base unit for me. And then I'm going to pay that vendor an additional 22,000 to accommodate my, my pressure and materials requirements. piping, instrumentation, and all those the, the setup for the unit. But we can go look back at some tables and say, well, of that bare module cost, how much is just due to the piping itself? Because we, what, we, what we're saying, we recognize that inside the bare module, we would have normally put in carbon steel. But what we need to do here is, if there's the requirement that the heat exchange is made from 316, there's, there's clearly going to be a requirement that the piping inside the bay module is also 316. Right? There's a reason, probably for corrosion or for, um, for uh, sanitary purposes, or whatever the case might be, that we've chosen to manufacture that heat exchanger from 316 rather than carbon steel. As a result of that, the piping that goes inside that 3 meter radius bay module likely also needs to be made from 316 stainless steel. So what we need to do is, is isolate from the bay module how much of that is due to piping? So what we do is if we come down, um, we, can, we can get this sort of information from tables. <coughs> Let's just take a look at where that uh, where this bay module factor comes from. So here's an example where imagine we bought a heat exchanger for one dollar. At the end, we're going to multiply that. FOE price we're paying the vendor, we're going to multiply that F, that one dollar by a factor of three, 3.37 in this case. We've been using 3.14. Uh, this table comes from a different textbook that's slightly different, but it's pretty close to um, the 3.14 that we've been using. So the spare one in fact is 3.37 in this particular example. We're going to multiply that by the base price of our heat exchanger to get the total price installed. But where does that 3.37 number come from? Or in Don Woods' table, uh, we've been using this factor of 3.14. How did, how did that number come about? That number comes about from, from several of the components that goes into the bed module, one of which is the piping. So 46 cents of the dollar spent in the heat exchanger is going to be spent in piping. Similarly, concrete steel instrumentation, instruments here, is only 10% of the original price. Uh, materials total adds up to 1.6, then there's the rest of it in the detail to get you to 3.37. The key, the key number that we're after here is that it's 46.46 is the fraction that's due to the piping itself when we multiply that by the FOB of the equipment. So for a base case where our heat costs a dollar, we're going to have to spend an additional 46 cents on the piping. So here the thinking is the same. If our incremental cost for materials and pressure is $22,000, we're going to have to multiply that by the same fraction to get the incremental cost for piping inside the bare module. So we have an additional line here, incremental cost for piping. And the, and the formula for it is to take your base case C0, multiplied by the factor for pressure, multiplied by the factor for materials, minus 1, then multiply by the piping factor, then multiply by another final factor, psi. And psi just says, if we take our bare module, 
right. which is a three meter by three meter by three meter around that heat exchanger. We can say, well, are we going to change 100% of the piping in the bare module, or 20, or 70%, or 80%? Or what fraction of the piping inside the bare module needs to also be changed from carbon steel up to stainless steel? You could say, well, 100% of the piping needs to be. But then you can also recognize, well, around this heat exchanger, not all of the piping is related to the, the materials flowing through the 316. There may be some piping that's just conduit. There may be some piping just to take drain and rain water away. So not 100% of the piping in this bay market is due to this incremental cost. So you can pick a number of psi anywhere between one. So in other words, you're deciding to replace 100% of the piping in the bay module or a value of 0.7. Anywhere in between that number would be a reasonable percentage of piping to be switched out to the highest uh, unit. So I'm going to use 0.7 uh, here in this particular example and finish up. So if we take this, this base cost over here, it is then $22,090. multiplied by 0.46, which is the fraction in the bare module cost due to piping alone, multiplied by 0.7, it's going to cost me an additional, in $1970, $7,100 to interchange this piping in my, in my unit, in my bare module. Okay, and now I'm in a position to finally tally up all the costs and get, get a bare module estimate here. So the first one is we're paying 6,210 to the vendor. This is for the base unit. So this would be something like a quotation that would be made up for you. So the base unit made from carbon steel uh, operating at 1 MPA and uh, we've already adjusted for capacity. Then we're paying that vendor as well an incremental $22,090 for materials and pressure. We're paying $30,000 and $30,290 uh, $30, for installation only. And then we're paying finally an additional 710 in additional material for piping. Well, we could just call this simply changed piping. The fact that we're using higher spec piping than we So these first two, they, they go to the vendor. Those first two dollar figures that you pay your supply of the unit. And then these last two, these go to whoever's managing and installing the unit for you. And if you sum those up, you get the number that's uh, in $1970. So if you add those up, you would then get $48,700. Inflate that up then to two thousand dollars is uh, three eight seven hundred and one oh eight nine divided by three hundred and one gets you one hundred and seventy six thousand two hundred plus or minus forty percent. So very different to that 321,000 figure that we naively estimated at the beginning. Okay, so it's, very, it's a very important why we go through this additional complexity to get a, a more refined range. And then if you report that range, which is the final set, it would be 106,000 to 247,000.